Good afternoon and good morning, everybody, and welcome to Tech Talks. Yeah, let's settle down, settle down. Our technical talks webinar today, yeah, thanks for laughing at that, David Vince, is going to be an hour long like all of them, and we do welcome you here to this, ladies and gentlemen, and we do ask that you please use the Q&A feature on the Zoom controls. We do not use chat. We found that chat jumps up in the face on the screen of the presenter, and that can be distracting, especially for engineers. So we're going to use the Q&A feature. We'll answer all questions. If not today, at the end of this presentation, verbally, then we'll get them all answered in writing. And all you have to do for this free webinar is return the survey monkey that we're going to send to you via email when this is done. And that survey monkey, for those of you that haven't done it yet, is really simple. We're going to verify the spelling of your first and last name and your email address and your company name, because that helps us know where you are and who you are and what you do. And we're also going to ask you a couple of questions. One's going to be uh, any questions that you didn't get to ask today during the Q&A, any questions you have after you go away and think about it. And then the other one's going to be any projects that you might need our help with. Again, like everything else that we do, there is no obligation. Um, if we help you with a project and we give you free advice, there's no obligation for you to go with that. We'll even give you a, a ballpark budget numbers is what we always do. Um, let's see if I can get this to advance on my screen. We are ASP Enterprises, Quick Supply Company, Bowman Construction Supply, and Cascade Geosynthetics, and that's a lot to say, but we are one company, family-owned, and I am the one civil engineer. You see that number on the screen. We've been in business for over 40 years in most of our locations, and we do have over 27 sales professionals throughout those four companies, and we now actually have over 12,000 customers and a whole bunch of CPESCs on staff. There's a map that Madeline made for us that shows the states that we're in. I am sitting right below that capital Q in Southern Iowa, but I'm blessed to be able to work in all of these states with all of these fine folks. I'm a licensed professional civil engineer in Iowa, but we are not practicing engineering here. We are helping you. Whether you're an engineer, a landscape architect, a city, county, state, federal employee, if you were a contractor or a landscape contractor, uh, or an architect, we've got them all, and we're thrilled to work with everybody in all aspects of a project from beginning to end. One of the things we're very, very good at is delivering products, and that can be a whole lot of products uh, for one project, and we can put them all together on one truck so you're not having to shop all over town. You know us already for our rolled products and our construction site products, uh, whether they be the erosion and sediment control products, our geogrids, geosynthetics, roadside stabilization products. Hardscapes are available in a number of our locations, but not all of them. And we do have the outdoor living spaces for patios, retaining walls, fireplaces, pizza ovens, cool stuff that I wish I could afford to have. And I specialize in stormwater management. That's uh, not just um, flood water or detention or volume protection, that's also water quality. And I also help a lot of our sales folks with technical support on our geosynthetics and erosion and sediment control and our construction site BMPs. We have a number of big warehouses and big yards and big trucks. So we can bring in a whole lot of product and have it readily available for you. Our contractor friends are our direct customers most often. Sometimes it is a government agency. But most of what I deal with are specified products. So if you want a product that I'm going to talk to you about today or any of our other presentations, you got to ask for it by name and then you get me. This contact information will appear again at the end of the presentation. I am recording this presentation. We will make that available on our website and our YouTube channel. For everyone that attends this today, you're going to get the one PDH certificate. If you do have to jump off early, we do ask that you get back on on your own time with the link that we'll provide. Finish watching the recording. And if you are not on here for more than 45 minutes today, um, if you ask me for a PDH certificate and say you went back and watched the recording, Madeline is going to uh, send that along to me and I'm going to ask you a question to prove that you attended and just to kind of get, uh, get to know you a little bit and then you'll get your PDH certificate. With that, I did print and I cannot reach my printer from here. I printed the bio for today's speaker and I've known him for years, but I thought it'd be a good idea to have his bio in writing. And that's not it. That was a bio for somebody else. I'm going to have to find it. I'm going to stall here, Ben. And what I'm going to end up doing, Ben, if I can't find it right away, because um, I did print it, but I didn't bring it into my office. So I'm going to have you help me with it. Actually, I got it. Here it is, buddy. All right. So Ben's on there, but I don't want him to introduce himself. That's not very fun. So I'm going to go a little quick on this one. Ben is a re registered professional engineer like myself. Um, not like me, though. He's registered multiple states. Kind of a show off. 
So he, uh, he's been in the industry for a long time. He's the market development manager at Propex Geo Solutions. He's got a civil engineering degree from Clemson, and he started his professional career as a consultant like I did. And he, uh, he's moved his way up to be water management group leader, at, and he worked for multiple engineering firms in, ma in a management level. And he led efforts in design and field work and utility, stormwater development projects. And he, for us at Propex, has played a key role in pioneering their development of engineered products. So he and I are two peas in a pod. Uh, he includes the scour lock system, which he's going to teach you about, about today, as well as Armor Max. And he's also going to talk to you about uh, specifications, details, installation guidelines on a high level, not get too deep into the weeds for the sake of time. But he really does have extensive knowledge of the civil engineering world, but also on the construction side. And he's really been a big asset to us. In fact, we've got Ed Nelson from ASP Enterprises on here. I did not ask Ed for a bio, but towards the end of Ben's presentation, he's going to tee up a case study for a project that he and Ed did together that's really interesting. So, Ben, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, and then you're going to be able to take over and share your screen. You should see that share screen option on your Zoom controls. It looks like you're sharing it now, and there it is. Ben, why don't you say hello to everybody? I think you might still be muted. Hello, Bill. Can you hear me now? I sure can. Everybody give it up for Ben Campbell. All right, Ben, thanks for joining us. Good luck. Yes, yes. Thank you so much <laughs> for such a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Well, as Bill mentioned, my name is Ben Campbell, and I am a market development manager at Propex, and he gave you a long bio, so we'll just go ahead and get on into the presentation here. Uh, hopefully this thing will work here. All right. So Propex has been around since the early 1900s. We're not just a company that popped up in the last 10 years because the in construction industry has been relatively good. Uh, we've been known under various namesakes, including Synthetic Industries and the Fabrics Division of BP Amico. Traditionally, we've been known to uh, manufacture our geotextiles, our woven and non-woven geotextiles. But what I'm going to talk to you more about today is our turf reinforcement mats and our high-performance turf reinforcement mats. Now, many of us in the industry have utilized these TRMs and HBTRMs, as they are abbreviated, uh, to solve erosion control issues. But I'm going to talk to you about how they can be used to solve bank stabilization issues and uh, slope stabilization issues. But before I get into how we stabilize banks, let's examine some methods of bank stabilization used in the past. One of my favorites is Detroit Armor. Now you may say this is an old photograph and I might have seen it before, but this Detroit Armor method actually still exists today. I've witnessed this with my very own eyes in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And if you see, as you can see from some of these pictures here, you can see that the bank is relatively stable. So, you know, why not stick to the tried and true method of Detroit Armor? Well, as we all know, it is not as environmentally friendly as we now hold ourselves to be. And we don't we don't carry that on our trucks, Ben. Just to be clear, we don't have those available. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that if you know if Propex couldn't make it with these TRMs and HPTRMs, I might have to go back to selling old junk cars. But <laughs> or some used tires. Uh, we have our Michelin armor. We got modern day pictures of, of tire armor and tire cell. So, and then graduating into what many engineers use today, we use it all the time, is rock. You know, very, there's variations of rock. There's rock in cages, uh, gabions. There's rock just set in channels. It's quite amazing, you know, how large of a rock can be transported by a small amount of water. And then taking another step up from rock, once you combine rock with Portland cement, you get concrete. Now, I like concrete because concrete, concrete's what they make bullet, you know, bomb shelters out of, so it's bulletproof. Um, as an engineer, I wanted to make sure that my plans were, you know, bulletproof plans. I could set it and forget it, never have to wake up in the middle of the night worrying about, oh, gosh, did I cover this? Well, you know, concrete can be bulletproof and bombproof, but it's very, very expensive. And, you know, it's not always what it's, you know, cracked up to be, so per se. You know, concrete always does what? Concrete will always crack, and water will always do what? Water will always find that crack, and it's in this case, you know, it found that crack and started eroding the soil beneath the concrete uh, channel, you know, particle by particle, then two particles by two particles, and so on and so forth, till it got to the point where the concrete could no longer bridge its weight, 
and it failed catastrophically like this. So, so much for all the extra money that was spent on this channel to concrete line it. So what is Propex's solution? Well, Propex's solution is to reinforce vegetation. To keep banks stable and to keep erosion at bay, you need to have a root system in place to hold the soil particles behind it. What happens though, is in many cases, whether it's due to a hydraulic load or a non-hydraulic load, vegetation can be stripped from the surface, exposing that soil, causing stability issues and obviously erosion issues as well. So our products have been used on a variety of projects, you know, levees, channels, coastal shorelines, non-coastal shorelines, and slopes by themselves. Our products are a green solution. You know, why are green solutions are important? We all understand this, you know, an environmental regulation, regulator, <laughs> sorry, regulators have gotten more keen on this as of late. And knowing that, you know, a vegetated swale can remove harmful nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus that comes in runoff and keep it out of our water bodies and keep it out of our streams. Because if we don't have this nutrient filtration, what can happen is, you know, downstream water bodies and lakes can start to have algae blooms. You know, the algae depletes the dissolved oxygen of a pond, which can result in fish kills and a whole bunch of ecological issues. Uh, so considering a green solution is not only uh, in many cases more economical, but it's better and better from an environmental standpoint as well. So these materials that um, we're talking about our HPTRMs and our TRMs, they are fall underneath the classification of a rolled erosion control product or RECP. Now it's important to understand that there's a vast array of these things, you know, it, anywhere from you know straw blankets coconut blankets um, nets that have synthetic fibers all the way up to what i'm going to talk mostly about today is our woven uh, high performance turf reinforcement mats now they all have their place in the industry and they all serve their purpose and they all have their associated cost as well our pyramid 75 is a material as i mentioned earlier it's a woven product it's it's a homogeneous woven product. It has a tensile strength of roughly 4,000 pounds per foot. It has a design life of up to 75 years. Some of you in the audience may have seen this pyramid before. It illustrates what the basic limits of vegetation are in an unreinforced state and a reinforced state. The typical grass species can withstand roughly four to five feet per second of velocity and about two pounds per square foot of shear stress. Now, I, I I'd like to talk about shear stress for a moment. In my younger days, I always thought about flow rates in terms of velocity, just feet per second. But it's important to understand that even though you might have a very low velocity, you could still have a high shear stress. You know, shear stress is a function of flow depth and slope. You know, so if you've got a slow moving body of water, but it's real deep, it could still have the ability to um, exert a lot of hydraulic shear on that channel bottom. So as you go up, uh, reinforcing it with a turf reinforcement mat, a high performance turf reinforcement mat, you can bring that resistance from five feet per second up to 25 feet per second, and all the way from two pounds per square foot up to 16 pounds per square foot. As much as I'm an engineer and I love numbers, I find comfort in numbers and sometimes discomfort in numbers depending upon the project, right? Uh, it's important to understand that um, you need to also under uh, consider qualitative values for the application that you're working on. If you're working on a, a, a low flow stream but has a high debris load, um, you know, some of the lower grade TRMs are not going to be as resistant to these debris loads or mowing loads or construction loads. So it's just something to think about and I wanted to point out. Let's take a moment to examine this stream that's flowing through an open area and look at the channel side slopes. They're exposed, there's no vegetation, and it's just exposed soil. Well, how did this happen? Well, why are we even talking about it? It's so obvious. As water's flowing by, it's washing away the bank and transporting soil particles downstream, causing you know, turbidity and pollution. But what's not as apparent and what a lot of people don't understand is that there's also another form of erosion happening here. You know, after a storm event, this stream is going to stage up. It's going to saturate the banks of the stream. And then after a certain amount of time, it's going to draw down. And the issue is that the water inside the saturated banks, well, it wants to draw down just as fast as the water inside the stream draws down, but it can't because it's got to flow through soil. So what it does is it creates a poor pressure in that soil that creates small little micro pop outs. So not only is this stream bank eroding when it's flowing, it's also eroding when it's not flowing because that buildup of poor pressure from saturation. 
It's just a continuous cycle. Here's a picture of a <clears throat> roadway uh, embankment here. You can see the guardrail up on the top and then this slope here that has a lot of grass on it. Obviously it was stable for a while because it had a good stand of vegetation. Then one day it decided to slip. You know, how did this happen? Well, the embankment received an excessive amount of rain, an excessive amount of saturation, and then all of a sudden the soil started to slip. You know, soil has to have a very specific moisture content to maintain its strength. At 0% moisture, we got dust. At 100% moisture, we got mud, and neither one of them are very strong. So why am I talking about these things, about pore pressure inside soil, about saturation inside soil, and how the heck are one of these mats that you place on the surface going to defend against those issues that are deeper inside the slope? Well, at Propex, we've innovated those mats and combined them with our engineered earth anchors. We drive these anchors through the mat into the embankment below it. The anchor consists mainly of a head that is driven into the ground and a top plate that sits on the surface and then a wire tendon that connects the two. Once it's installed, the wire tendon is pulled kind of like in a post-tension case to exert a force to hold the soil together. We manufacture these anchors in three main types, uh, anywhere from three feet uh, long to 12 feet long, and they can have a pullout resistance of up to 2,500 pounds. Here's a quick section rendering of what that might look like with the HPTRM, our Armor Max trenched in at the bottom, trenched in at the top, and then anchored through the anchor trenches and along the slope surface, holding vegetation in place. If we go back to our stream bank that was staging up and drawing down and creating a bunch of pore pressure, this is how the anchors work, is they function as an artificial deep root system with the mat between the anchors to hold the natural root system in place. And so when, uh, after a drawdown and we got a lot of saturation and forces are pushing the bank apart, the material can hold itself together and keep the vegetation in place. Here's just some pictures of what installation might look like. As you'll notice here, this material is tan in this picture. We manufacture this material in two main colors, tan and green. And there's a variety of different anchor driving devices that are used. Uh, this is what installation on a three to one slope might look like with a handheld device. On some of the steeper slopes that require deeper anchors, a contractor may elect to use a man lift like you see here with a larger breaker hammer. They can also, um, utilize these what we call platform sleds that are tethered off to a piece of equipment at the top. Now I know that um, it's going to be pretty hard to find a slope one-to-one um, -one or more or less that you see here and some of the geographies that we're working in, but just wanted to show this picture to give an illustration of what that might look like. All right. So, you know, with all these different materials, we got the straw blankets, coconut blankets, we got these woven materials, we got them in green and tan. You know, how do I know what is the right material for my project? Well, that's where we come into play. You can contact us and we have a fully staffed engineering services division. We have about five engineers on, in our office here that evaluate projects every day. They run slope stability analyses, they run hydraulic analyses, they maintain our CAD details. We customize them all the time. It's, it's amazing. You know, you think placing this material on a slope, you'd have one detail and that would be it, but there's all sorts of other considerations, other constraints of a project. And um, we generate those details. We can send them to you in DWG format. You can edit them as you wish. Um, we also have a CSI format of specifications. If you have a project manual, a spec book, we also offer testing and field support where we'll actually go out there to the site and get the contractor oriented on the products um, to show them how to properly install the materials and how to most efficiently install the materials. It's a, you know, good for quality assurance, quality control. And you might ask, well, how much does all this cost? And the answer is nothing. We perform this, all these services free of charge and under no obligation to utilize the product either. And there's many cases out there where we'll, you know, get some project information. We'll come back with a design. And if for whatever reason, it's not the best fit or the engineer determines it's not the best fit or best solution, 
at least we've got a dialogue and we understand, you know, how these products work and um, can move on and hopefully be used on another project. So there's absolutely no obligation and no cost for these services. Uh, we'll get into a couple case studies for Armor Max here. Uh, this is a project along a roadway embankment, bridge crossing. We see this every day. Um, this slope was very stable. One day it decided to slip. It just was an unfortunate situation where it slipped, was right above these drainage inlets. And so the DOT knew something had to be done to this slope. Otherwise, if it was allowed to persist, the slope could come down, clog these inlets, then you'd have uh, standing water in the travel lane, and you could risk hydroplaning and accidents and all kinds of uh, risks to the public safety, and nobody wants that, especially if you're in the engineering business. So they elected to utilize our Armor Max system with our mat and our anchors to stabilize that slope. Once the slope was you know, recompacted, they got some pictures here showing uh, the anchors, and we also, in between each anchor, we place a 12-inch pin. And this project was in Texas, I think if you might've seen earlier, but they utilize sod to establish vegetation. It's very important that when you utilize these, uh, by definition, they're called turf reinforcement mats and they do need the turf to function properly. You do need to have a root system. So our details and our specs call it out, but there's many cases where a contractor will just roll out the material and walk away without any consideration for seeding or sodding but um, you can utilize sod, you can also utilize seed, you can also, and also hydro seed to vegetate these systems. Here's a steep slope along a riverbank where uh, this, uh, along the riverbank was a chemical facility that had a barge onload offload dock. As you can see here, the bank was sloughing and this chemical facility owner was puzzled because, you know, as you can see from some of these pictures here and some of the later pictures, that the river pretty much stayed down low. And you can see there's trees along the bank here. What happened was when they decided to build a dock out to the river for the barge onload offload, they cut a lot of these trees down. And without those tree roots in place, the bank was no longer stable. But, you know, the river very rarely staged up very high, but the owner noticed that this bank continued to creep closer and closer to his fence. And he was worried that ultimately the pipe infrastructure would be jeopardized. So you can see here what that dock comes off of the, uh, the land and goes out to the river. So what we did is we actually performed a slope stability analysis of this slope. We had uh, some borings drilled in nearby and got some soil characteristics and determined that the slope had a factor of safety of 0 0.98. Now, anything with a factor of safety less than one means it should be failing. And, you know, depending upon what we're designing, whether it's steel or geotechnical stability, there's different target factors of safety and things like that. Uh, the goal for slope stability is to have a factor of safety about 1.5. So this was right around a 0 0.98 or one existing condition. And what was happening here is that after every storm event, the soil on the surface would saturate and it would then uh, lose its strength and slough and then just continue to creep back further and further. So our analysis, after we got that soil's information, like I mentioned, we determined that by utilizing our B2 anchors at a nine foot depth on a four by two and a half foot spacing, generally it's about a four by four uh, foot spacing of these anchors, we were able to bring the factor of safety all the way up to 1.55. Here's some pictures of what uh, regrading that slope looked like. The contractor was trying to compact it as best they can. Uh, they cut a trench at the top and a trench at the bottom. And then the materials um, such that it's light enough where a person can carry it, set it in the trench and roll it on out. Dep you know, they can pre-cut it to the length that's needed and then roll it on out. Uh, pins are then placed in the material in order to hold it in place. And then anchors are then driven after that. So here's just some more pictures of what that looks like. These are the anchors that have the tendons sticking out. These guys are 
Um, sorry, something happened here. What'd you do? I told you this is why I was going to host it. I know. And then I'm going to count down and you better get back on that slide. I'm, like, <laughs> so I'm going to grab the steering wheel from you. What is going on? So is it there? Well, back to your intro slide. Gosh. It says document recovery. It looks like it failed on you. So why don't you scroll down to where you were? That's I'm just bird. chiming in to help you stall. I could just let you sit there and flounder up on the stage till they start throwing stuff at you, but I don't have a boo soundtrack to play. <laughs> Man, that is a boo right there. I tell you what, that's a first. I never had that happen before. And this is what I told you on the phone this morning, but you're doing all right. Keep on trucking and it's close to one o'clock. So you know, you should be about halfway. Yep. We're rolling on through. All right. So uh, these guys here, they're actually setting the anchor with a device we call a jack jaw. Um, so once they set all these anchors, they'll come back and cut all these pin, um, cables. And once they are cut, uh, between these two pictures here, so they had uh, they utilized seed to establish vegetation on this slope, which um, they spread about an inch to two inches of topsoil. Basically, you can just take a, a skid steer and dump it at the top and just let it run down and break it across the surface and then they seeded it and then rolled out a straw blanket because as you can see from the trees here this was during uh, the early spring that they did this project and they wanted to make sure the seeds didn't wash off due to rain or birds picking it off here's a shot on march 13th of last year and then here's a shot exactly two months later on may 13th you can see you've got an excellent stand of vegetation here the slope is very stable um, but we take a closer look as we walk out on that dock. We look over here. We're wondering what's going on over here. Take a closer look. We can see that this is an area where the contractor did not armor. You can see the straw blanket on top, but there's no green armor max below it. So it's very unfortunate that they didn't carry this on down for the owner's sake. Um, I guess they probably looked at the corner of the fence or the support and determined, okay, that's the limits of where we're going to armor. But nonetheless, it's a good side-by-side um, -side comparison of what it looks like armored and not armored. Um, Bill, are there any questions at all that have come through on the armor max? Uh, I have scour lock up next that I'll talk about, which no, is a nothing derivative. Specific for, nothing specific for armor max. You're doing great. Okay, good deal. So, um, our product called Scourlock is kind of a derivative of our other geotextiles and our Armor Max. It's another bank stabilization product that we use. Here's a rendering of what Scourlock looks like. It's kind of like a gabion basket. And here's a little basket here with the Scourlock cells and then Armor Max going up the slope. One thing that's unique about Scourlock is that it allows you to fill it with soil, whereas with the regular gabion, you have to fill it with stone. So take a for instance, this design section where if we were to utilize a gabion basket here, we would have to excavate a certain amount of soil out to establish the, the foundation layer. And then we have to haul that off. And then we'd have to bring in a bunch of rock and fill up these baskets. Well, what Skyrock allows you to do is excavate this out or whatever slough material might be there. You can set it aside, place the basket in this, go ahead and take that material and put it right back in there. So you're eliminating an export cost as well as an import cost of material. Uh, Scourlock is kind of like Legos. You can build it in a variety of configurations. Um, we have, you know, one basket tall, two basket tall, three, four. We, we've got designs out there for five baskets tall. What it is is uh, it's a welded wire cage. And inside of it is a non-woven geotextile liner. That's what holds the soil in place. And then on the face of it, we have our Armor Max HPTRM that's fastened to the face of it, but it's fastened in a way that creates these small pockets at each cell. So you can fill um, the inside of the cell with any kind of soil really, or even stone. And I got some pictures I'll show you um, in a moment, but then you can take an organic topsoil, place it on the face, like a soil veneer, along with some seed. And then um, it could become a green wall. Um, so these units, they, they arrive folded up on a pallet, like you see in this picture here, and they can be expanded with two people and filled up. Then the cover is placed over it and you can stack it on top of each other. So here's a picture of what that looks like inside the trench of a live project. 
you got scour lock units being you know, lowered in with a piece of equipment, then expanded. Uh, these units can also be anchored to the slope. Uh, depending upon what the slope characteristics are, um, we actually analyze the slopes with these baskets as well to determine geotechnical stability. And if they do need some additional tieback or not, that you know depends upon whether or not there's a uh, you know a real tall slope above it or what those soil components might be. Uh, you can fill it with stone or soil. This project needed to fill the bottom row. This is a two basket tall project, and they needed to fill the bottom row with stone. Um, sometimes you need it for additional ballast because the unit weight of stone is heavier than, than soil, but in other instances you need it to be able to provide for a certain amount of drainage layer to drain the water uh, from the slope behind it out to the face of the unit and then into the stream itself. And here's some pictures of um, filling the face of the unit with the topsoil mixture and what that might look like. So. He's got the topsoil and the seed here on the face here right before they're going to cover this up. This picture shows what that system looks like there. Now, a lot of reactions I get for these types of walls are that, gosh, you know, that really looks ugly. This is not um, an architectural block wall or something that's meant to have a, you know, stamped in place concrete design on it. It's, you know, something that's meant to be, you know, out there in the, nat in the wild and the nature that could vegetate and also Provide, be provided a significantly less cost than those other uh, architecturally pleasing walls. So from this picture, you can see that, uh, that here's a creek that was coming in from right to left, it was flowing from right to left and making almost a 180 degree bend. What it was doing is it was coming in here, it was hitting this bank, eroding out this bank, and then shooting out the, the other side. Then up here to the top of the picture is an actual access street to a local school it was getting to the point where this bank was so eroded that it was getting ready to jeopardize that access road. So something had to be done. About eight months after construction, you can see that we got a good amount of vegetation here. And so there was, you know, there's natural woods upstream, downstream, and across the stream. And the hope is that one day that this whole area will, area will return to the woods that it once was. You can plant trees in it plant all kinds of things and you live stake the face you can see here after nine months there's a lot of vegetation that's starting to come up um, more so on the bottom than the top because the bottom gets hydrated a lot more but um, nonetheless the slope, slope is doing very well and to this day very stable all right um so we got a project here that we worked with ASP on in uh, Illinois. It was a pipeline project and pipeline owner had called us in to look at some solutions. You can kind of see here that from this slope here that there's a big slough right here that's getting ready to come into the stream itself. The stream bank had failed. There's about a four to five foot slough right there. So the steps to, we came up there, we evaluated it, we came up with an option uh, that looked very similar to the uh, case study I just kind of showed you with a, the scour lock at the bottom and then armor max going up the top. So the procedure to rebuild this slope would be to remove any of the sloughed material that was really loose and set it aside. You can bring it back and recompact it, but you need to get the loose material out of there. Um, Just some more shots of what that was looking like once they pulled that loose material out. And then they started placing scour lock units here. And you can see here that the scour lock has the ability to kind of articulate or fit almost any kind of curve. Um, this one curves in two directions here. They filled it up with a soil and stone combination. And that's what that kind of looks like there. So these guys, um, you know, once the stone has been placed, they just, you know, rake it across, smooth it out, get it ready for the next layer. You can see once they're out of the water, the stream bypass can be released and 
Uh, they can continue to build the slope from the bottom up. And I don't know if, um, if Ed or Bill would like to comment on any of this. You're more than welcome to chime in whenever you'd like. Well, but, to be fair, I'll let our audience know that we just invited Ed Nelson late last night. <laughs> he, he, he knew we were going to give the webinar here a couple of weeks ago, but I hadn't made any plans for him to prepare to speak. But Ed, this is Ed's project. Ed, if you want to unmute yourself and add anything, you can um, instruct Ben to back up to previous slides if you want, or you can just narrate with this slide. What would work best for you, Ed? Um, no, that's fine, I guess, to go from here. Um, what what I was going to say uh, with this coming in, one of the one of the things that uh, that Ben uh, didn't mention earlier on that that kind of goes along and just kind of shows kind of ties in what Bill was saying with Ben's presentation. But um, we also found some areas on this slope when we went out um, and they started uh, the excavation on it that we had several areas where the so the slope was uh, seeping water out of uh, out of the hill a couple of different areas around so one of the other components that took place to this was uh, they went across the slope at those areas and we put in a, an actual vertical drain board oh. uh, across the slope to uh, be able to handle that water coming coming back in where's that um, at with respect to the scour lock that's shown here it would be there was one just about above on that next layer up you can kind of see in that middle of the picture, you can kind of see a hole there okay. uh, over there to your left. About in that area was one. And then there was one about a quarter of the way top down from the top of the slope. Um, kind of, uh, yeah, probably and, about 20 feet down the slope from the top. There was another and, area. And even though Propex is our guest presenter, um, everybody on the call knows we carry a lot of products. Are you? Do you want to say what product you use there uh, we, for that drink? We, that's fine. Um, we use the uh, American Whip Drain 114 of the uh, flat drain, 24-inch uh, wide flat drain that we set in there vertically uh, across the slope. And then does the bottom of that outlet down to the, the it stream? outlets out to the side and then comes down to the stream at the bottom. Okay. Right? Yeah. Boy, so, as an engineer, I love that. That's awesome. Did, how who came up with that in the, as a field design? <laughs> uh, the, the 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 only person that was not an engineer on the site built uh, that you. that was me. Um, that a I boy. Actually, I For actually every... came, well, I actually came up with it, and then I contacted Ben, and and uh, told him what was going on, and that asked his opinion, and and so it was. That's awesome. Well, that but, sounds too good to be true. I bet people no. think that we planned this, but no, that's awesome. I, that's why I love having you on here. Um, you're a huge asset, not just to our company, but to whoever's project you're working on. That yeah. That's the kind of thing that they don't teach in school. Or they do, but they don't teach you how to identify it and that. So even though you didn't go to engineering college, it <laughs> might not have mattered. Yeah. The, the college of hard knocks and real world is what helped you there. Yeah. So that, that actually, that actually helped as well um, with the, uh, with the, uh, water seeping out of the slope. So um, you can go back to the picture where where Ben was um, on the layers you, of the scour there lock. Yeah, um, put putting that in. I will tell you. I will tell you just to add a little bit to what Ben said in in dealing with the contractors on site every day. Um, these guys had said they had done gabion basket before. They'd placed riprap anchors before done several other uh, types and the guy said just like any job when you're working in the creek it's tough but um, they said this was a very very easy install uh, for them to give them a good uh, toe to the slope to, to work a base off of that's so, excellent because it looks like it'd be kind of nasty you know it was it was nasty in the water yeah for sure that first layer but uh, yeah they, they bragged about the ease of, of being able to put that in and, and how, how easy it was and the stability of it. So, yeah, look at them just walking along there, just on their feet. That That's great. Once they're out of that mud, the rest of the project's smooth sailing. That's awesome. You can go ahead, Ben. I was just going to add that for now. What, no. what time of year did you say this was installed? We, we did. I'm trying to think now, but we started that. We did that this year, started in, uh, spring summer 
Yeah, right? I think these pictures. I think these pictures were taken in June, and it was nasty hot. It was a hundred or some degrees out there, and um, yeah, it was very, very tough conditions. And no, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Ed. And uh, once Ed brought that up idea up about using the American Wick Drain, I'd, I'd actually been trying to incorporate that in our designs for a while, and I was very happy to hear that we had an opportunity that presented itself where we could combine those, you know, to you know furnish multiple products that ASP could provide. Uh, for a combined solution. It was, it was really, really cool. That's one of the things that we're known for. And I'm glad Ed's on here because we used to have it called the Midwest most trusted site solutions provider. I don't know, maybe a few more words. <laughs> but now, now I think it's just you're trusted since we're out West too. But um, what people need to understand is there's other products that look similar and there's other solutions that look similar to each other. But the two things we do, number one, we partner with the best manufacturers in the world who actually make really high strength, high quality, consistent products that are proven in the lab, proven in the field and have really good test results. The other one is we know how to recommend the right solutions that fit a project. We're not just coming in there with one sticker on our shirt that says, and no offense to you, uh, Ben, but we don't just have like one product for every category that we represent. We represent a lot of different manufacturers. We, I joke that we would look like NASCAR drivers if Ed had to go out on site with all of his patches and <laughs> logos from every, <laughs> everything that he could offer. So it's always good to kick around ideas. And I love that my friend Ed is not an engineer because I was raised by a contractor. Uh, I don't have any engineers in my family uh, other than Ben engineers drive me nuts. Sorry to my friends who are on this call. Um, if we try to overthink things or if we don't listen to other people's input. So some of the best solutions I've ever seen came from asking somebody in the field who's wearing work boots and had dirty hands and they they would just use common sense and i love that so keep going ed do you have anything else you want to keep adding because this is good stuff um, we're actually ed, doing good on time. as he go, as he goes along um, okay. i can i can add more this is really all i have for here keep going ben yeah sure sure and we've actually got another couple of products that asp provided on this project as well so they really are a, a one-stop shop uh, for a variety of options so um so once the bank was you know the toe was established with the scour lock units then the contractor would start rebuilding the slope above it as, you know, as so. Um, here's a view from the top of that uh, slope looking down. You can see the creek there as they're starting to deploy the Armor Max material. And this contractor, you can't really see it here, but you can see uh, when I zoom in here, they utilized what uh, I depicted in some of the earlier pictures of platform sled that they were able to tie to a piece of equipment there up at the top and drive the anchors through the material into the slope to keep that slope uh, intact. They built this out of steel. Uh, so there's a variety, we actually have one of these now and we are making another one that we can send out to the different job sites so the contractors don't have to build it. It's made out of aluminum and it can be moved up and down the slope with a few people and it's got some cleating mechanisms on it that actually hold it to the slope while they're driving an anchor so they can set it in place, drive an anchor, then kind of let it slide down to the next anchor spot and drive another anchor. And then picking it up and bringing it up to the top is a little bit of a challenge, but nonetheless, it gives them a little platform. It's like a, a stepping stool for a slope. And there's a close up there of the sled in action tied to this bulldozer as you see here and i apologize i broke my own rule and used the chat there i was trying to talk to one of our attendees that raised their hand you just keep on rolling and i'll deal with that in the q a no problem so uh, this view shows what it looks like when all the the green material has been laid and now it looks brown well, why is it brown it's because once the armor max was installed the contractor then utilized uh product called Proganix from Profile, which is actually um, dis distributed by ASP as well. It's a biotic soil media. It's just kind of a soil substitute. They spray directly on top of the mat and it gives the seeds something to grow into and the roots to grow into. It's very, you know, a lot of studies, I'm sure many of us on the phone or uh, on the call here are familiar with that. So once they installed the Proganix and they came back and turned it green. 
not just because it's a Christmas season, but because uh, they then sprayed another product called Flex Terra that's also um, manufactured by another uh, by profile as well and distributed by ASP. And uh, Flex Terra is actually a fiber uh, bonded fiber matrix that uh, holds things together, holds the, you know, the proganics together, and keeps it from sloughing off until the seeds have germinated and taken root and grown through the material. So. This is what that looks like up close um, with the Armor Max, the Proganics, and then the Flex Terra. And in there is a, a seed mixture as well. And we look forward to being able to get some more updated shots, but I do understand this area is probably closed down due to hunting season at the moment. Um, but we hope to update these slides with some vegetated shots here in the near future. Yeah, it uh, in in Illinois is anybody who's on the call from Illinois knows October first starts uh, hunting season. This was uh, the the Dakota pipeline crossed a uh, farmer's uh, field. There's a bean field off to the left there on the other you know the other opposite side of the creek. And uh, actually, when I was out there this summer and they were installing, they were putting deer stands up as we spoke. So there was a crunch timeline on which they had to be done and out. Uh, prior to the October 1st start of season. So I have been unable to go back and take any uh, uh, vegetated uh, pictures, which we'll have to wait until uh, spring for that. And I will get those out. Um, one of the other things that I would like to, uh, to, to mention as a kind of a plug for, for you guys that are uh, possibly looking at projects like this with Cropex, we, when we were out on this site, Ben was showing the sled and so forth, and they were coming down and driving those anchors in the ground. We ran into a couple of areas uh, in driving those anchors because we had a certain embedment depth that we were trying to hit uh, based on Propex's design. And uh, we came in in a couple of areas, um, either rock or whatever reason, uh, a couple areas we were not able to drive to that depth. And uh, so I contacted Ben and Propex was very responsive to what we were going to do to make a change uh, to that in the depth at which we would drive and possibly change the pattern. Like Ben had said, they typically do it in a, in a certain pattern based on the needs of the project. Um, very responsive, no waiting for answers or phone calls, uh, on the fly decisions. Um, which worked out to be very well and, and kept the project moving along at a, at a timely manner. Uh, so big thanks to Propex for all the help. We would have, would have never pulled this deal off uh, without them. This was the, the contractor, uh, his very first time of ever installing this material. Um, as Ben had mentioned earlier on, we went out to site, um, did initially in one of the coldest days of the year, uh, went out and did a site review with them, took measurements, um, so forth, put together a plan. Then one of the hottest days of the year, of course, we were, we were installing it, but Ben and the Propex team were out. Uh, we had a, a pre-con meeting and then we had an install meeting on site, uh, showing them how to put it in and uh, how to install the material and, and it just couldn't have been handled better. And I, I would also say that this landowner was a bear of a guy to deal with. Um, very, very particular, extremely frustrated with the, with the pipeline company and after they had installed it the way it had been finished. And the guy, uh, I talked to him when the project was done, we got done doing the hydro seating and he said, this blew me out of the water beyond my wildest expectations of how good this slope would look when we were done based on what we started with. And the guy said, I wouldn't even mind if the, my kitchen window looked out at this slope now, it looks that good. So just, uh, just overall a fantastic project, great design, contractors did a, a fantastic job and everybody's very, very happy. So thank you, Ben, for all your help on that to, to be able to pull that off, it's great. Oh, no, the, all the thanks is owed to you guys and your support. Yeah, that's a good point that Ed brought up about the anchoring. You know, we typical specs will specify a certain depth and a certain anchor pattern. And there's a lot of times where you get out in the field and there's a rock there, or you can't achieve it. 
and you know we we are able to evaluate that and on the fly and make recommendations as we need to be able to ensure that the product still is going to hold in many cases if you know for anchor depth if you can't get a desired depth what's most important is a pullout resistance and generally if you can't get to a certain depth you're stuck in some really hard material and that material is going to give you excellent pullout resistance so we're able to work around those kinds of things but you know, if you do have a project that includes these products and you run into obstacles we're there to support as ed mentioned you know whether it's snowing or it's 150 degrees out we can be on site take care of things and um, you know we want to make the project successful so we're there to, to help for sure well you can click through the rest of your slides we're at 121 we're doing good on time i don't know how many more pictures you have if any yep that brings us right to the end so oh, that's perfect timing I'm, i appreciate <laughs> you and ed so we do have a question here, and it may have already been answered. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, how does the bottom anchor set? And that came in after Armor Max when you were you were in the early slides of Scour Lock. So I'm not sure if they're asking about the bottom anchor for the Armor Max or if they're talking about Scour Lock. Okay. Um, well, all the anchors are set in a similar way. Uh, once they're driven, they're we use utilize the same device to pull tension on the cable to set the anchor. Now, if they were talking about the He's scour Armor lock, Max. he just chimed in and said Armor Max. Thank you, Leon. Okay. Um, yeah, so the one that's in the trench, you know, we just place the jack jaw or the device into the trench and pull tension on the anchor and set it in the trench, uh, just as we would along the slope face. That's well, I'm going to go in and start sharing on my screen because I want to get that same presentation pulled up and show what you're talking about and get towards the last slides. Um, in fact, I'm just going to go really quickly. So, and we have um, several videos right out there. there that we have several videos out there that show. Um, That's how great. This That's a great point. So I'll go back to your slide. So if they go to your website and our website, they can get to your website. They can actually see the videos that explain the installation procedure. Hey, Bill, can I chime in here just for a quick second? You can. Uh, uh, and I, I'm, like I said, I'm not sure that I understand the question, but I will tell you that a very similar question came up by my contractors on the site. He said, I understand this jack jaw that's going to pull tension on the anchor. I understand that, he said. But he goes, what I do not understand is what's the difference. If I drove it into the slope that way, I should be able to pull it out. So just, just in layman, non-engineering terms, what I explained to him is, as you can see, that little bullet that's at the bottom that is the actual anchor. So I explained to him, once that's driven into the ground with the drive steel and they put that jack jaw on it and they pull on that cable, that, that actual anchor at the bottom flips. So yep, just like this. it's not so driven straight in the ground. So it flips horizontally at the point and then that's what sets your pullout screen and the contractor said oh well that was easy yep. i just i didn't understand what you meant so i don't know that that's what he's talking about but for lay people out there that's what happens and that's how you get there that might be and then so this on this slide that's there now i love that you said that ed so the the anchor actually points in the direction of the cable because you're driving it in and this is sideways but you're you're driving that in in the direction of the cable and then when you tug on it it pivots 90 degrees just like shown in this graphic that's right that's Perfect. exactly right thank you both for answering that good job leon you asked a good question and then here's what ed was explaining when it turns 90 degrees it creates that cone of influence that ben had mentioned so that's awesome. Excellent. And I've driven these as well. So now that we're getting close to the bottom on the Q&A, um, th somebody else asked, and you already answered it, about this um, rig that you use going up and down the steep slopes. And they commented back, and they, they had used the chat feature um, to raise their hand. They commented back, commented back that you did answer that. Um, how much of the scour lock stack is typically below grade? Um. We generally recommend it at least a foot at the very least of embedment. Now, um, depending upon the stream characteristics, uh, as you can see from some of the pictures I showed you, there was about two to two and a half feet uh, of embedment. It just depends on what we're looking at geotechnically and stream wise. And so that's part of getting you involved to help with that advice? Yes, please 
call us. We're here to help. We love to help. Um, you're bored if you don't get a help. I mean, yeah, really. we're, we're, we're real bored if we don't have projects to help with and, you know, <laughs> and we, we don't, we don't apply any pressure about the products. We just, you know, are, are here to help and help, you know, let us be an extension of your resources. You know, I think that's important a- that you say that because some people feel because with other consultants, you know, you and I were both private consultants before we got into this world, um, this industry, and there's a, there's a pressure to take the engineer's advice and to, cause you're paying for it. You're paying hourly and you better do what they say. And it's kind of like other professions. I don't want to name them. Uh, you kind of got to do what they say. Well, with us, Ben and I, and other people like us, um, we get to give free advice and you are not obligated to follow it. You're obligated to make a mistake and do something that doesn't agree with us. <laughs> but all kidding aside, you're not obligated to follow Ben's advice or my advice or even Ed's advice. Although I think we've all learned you should follow Ed's advice. advice. But Ben and I, uh, both being engineers, if someone, if Ed brings a project to me and asks questions about a project that looks like this on your screen right now, I'm not going to know how to answer that. I'm a civil engineer, but I'm not an expert in um, Propex's products as much as they are. I know them all. I got to be pretty good at everything that we carry, but I can go to the product experts who, by the way, when Ben shows up, he can have one logo on his shirt and it can be that one at the top right of your screen. So he can go all in being an expert on that product. And he works well with us on the other products, as he already mentioned. But I think getting you involved is hugely important, right, Ben? Up front, the sooner the better. Yeah, please do. There's nothing to lose, you know. And um, if, if, if Propex's solution is not the right option, I'm very certain ASP has another one that is. So I won't name them today, but we've got a lot of solutions. Uh, one of the things that's heartbreaking is when someone asks you for advice after it's too late. When someone says, hey, what should I have done? Well, that's a painful question to ask because it's really painful to answer. Um, it's kind of like people ask me their opinion of an old car they bought after they bought it. Well, you don't want to know because I'm going to have to tell you the car is ugly. It's an ugly baby or whatever. <laughs> you can't ask for advice after the fact. You got to ask ahead of time so you can end up with something like this where the owner who is totally frustrated comes away overwhelmingly satisfied. So you get to under promise, over perform with a project like this. So we're getting close to the end of the time. I use this as an opportunity to remind people who we are, where we are. Um, when you call me, if I see your area code is in Illinois, I'm going to say, hi, this is Bill from ASP. If I see you're in Colorado, I'm going to say, hi, this is Bill from Bowman Construction Supply. And if you're out in the Pacific Northwest or Alaska, I'm going to say, hi, this is Bill from Cascade Geosynthetics. But for today, I'm Bill with Quick Supply because I'm right below the queue. And again, I work with all of these companies. Ben works with all of us. Uh, Ed works at, in Illinois. He is the reason we have Illinois shaded there but he can also work in and around the St. Louis area. And we have a great team at ASP St. Louis. We call them ASP Fenton. So ASP has offices in St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, Wichita, Kansas, also serving Oklahoma. Quick Supplies in Des Moines, Iowa, serving the entire state of Iowa. Bowman Construction Supply has three offices in Colorado, also serving Wyoming. And Melissa Hurley and friends out at Cascade Geo, we just added them a few months ago. She's in Portland, but she can cover all of those states shown, Portland, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. And I have another slide. Oh, darn it. I didn't, I didn't leave it in here. Um, it was just for fun because we are getting up to the holidays. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that uh, our webinar series that I was going to continue to next Wednesday is actually going to be put on hold through the holidays. I will resume it on January 6th. If you have not gotten on our mailing list, please send me a message. Um, you can see our websites there. Go to ASPENT.com. And again, answer the survey monkey. Send that back to us so we can send you your PDH certificate. Ask us more questions. Ben and I will go back and type written answers to all those questions and send that out to every attendee. And Ed, thank you for being on here. Ben, thank you for being on here. Any other things you guys want to add in the last 10 seconds? I would just like to give an extra thanks to the audience and thank you for joining us today. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if there's something we can help you with. Thanks for the invite, Bill. You bet, guys. Thanks, everybody. Um, Safe travels if you're traveling. Um, Hope everybody stays healthy and safe and Merry Christmas. Take care.